Yes. Okay. Put an I S try on. them. The other one that they were suggesting to me is get on one of these digital things where uh, you just output and uh, you don't uh, talk to anybody, but if they hear you, they'll get back to you type of thing mm. with the USB. So I've got to look at that one too. So, wow, this guy made it through New Year's. Good yeah, stuff. Hello, Tim. Oh, I guess I should turn my mic on. How's it going? Everybody survived New Year's and Christmas okay? Somewhat. Somewhat, yeah, I know. <laughs> Hello, Eric. Hey, everybody. How are you? How you doing, Is my mic, my mic working this time? Yes. Yep, great. Hi, Dwayne. Hey, I was going to get one of these little plug-in USB cameras rather than always relying on this camera on the, uh, on the laptop. That way I can plug it in my other computer. Any recommendations or just something around 30 bucks from uh, from Staples should do the trick? You might want to spend a little bit more. I spent some time uh, looking into them a few months ago, but the prices were ridiculous all last year, right? Uh, so um, Logitech makes some yeah. nice ones. Uh, I think it was like a 920, if I recall correctly. They're, I think, in the... Not, not that much more, maybe double what you said, 60, 70 or something okay. like that. And uh, yeah, I think you're right. These built-in ones, they're fine in, you know, for well, good enough, but yeah, you know, you're always limited to, you know. You're talking about webcams? Uh, yeah, webcams. I'm using a Logitech, an older one. Yeah. I just find the resolution on these, uh, you know, some of these newer ones uh, work, you know, just they look better, you know, like sharper, crisper images. I mean, uh, look at Peter's image. It's always, you know, uh, nice and sharp and, uh, you know, shows every, every, every defect. Uh, so. Yeah, but he's a good looking guy, so that helps. <laughs> yeah. So anyway uh yeah i think that's that's right just wait till the price comes back down to normal like uh look at the uh, history on camel or whatever and uh make sure it's within reasonable you know uh error bars or whatever i think that's uh, the way to do it with that it's just they were like asking 120 and more uh about six months ago so i just gave up and said eh, use what i have so. you ever notice that everybody in town and everybody and their brother has got a YouTube channel that they're milking like crazy. You know, some good channels out there, but it seems like everybody has a channel now. Well, I guess you know, there, is, there is some money in there, but you've got to have a lot of viewers to make anything worthwhile. Well, that, you know, Dave down in the States, uh, down in Australia there, he, he did a segment on how much did he actually make because that's his full-time job. I forget now the details of it, but uh, he went through the whole thing. Well, there's a machinist out of Florida, which I, uh, who I follow quite regularly. I mean, he puts out a video almost every week. It's called A Bomb. Is Adam Booth Machining, and he's like old school uh, machinist. None of this uh, computer aided crap. He's got a shaper and milling machine and all that stuff. He does uh, he does spray welding, which I find kind of interesting. But I pulled up his stats one. Well, he's making 30 G's a year U.S. on this uh, on his channel. So he's doing all right. Yeah, if you can supplement like that, why not, right? Um, I, I guess if you have a you know, unique idea or even a non-unique idea, it seems these days, you know, you can uh, you can you know make a little bit of extra cash. So I don't know. Maybe once we put these up on our uh, you know homebrew YouTube, we can start splitting it thirteen ways. You know, you never know. <laughs> this is good luck this to is you. Some, yeah, <laughs> this is some pretty unique. Uh, Maybe it'll cover the beer we drink during our meetings. That's about oh, it. Would be like if we made a made a penny a year. <laughs> we'll have to share that one beer. Everybody gets one piece of double bubble. <laughs> you still make that? Yeah, they do. I drive by the factory almost every day. Fleer, right? So it it's it's still a thing. <laughs> hmm. Still has the cartoons inside. Oh, I, no, I don't know about that. Okay. But they're probably politically correct now. Yeah. Double Bubble and Bazooka Joe. Mm. 
Dave said he'd be about 10 minutes late. He's uh, recovering. Uh, he sent me a picture of him getting uh, the, the jab, capital J, this afternoon. So he is, uh, I guess, the only one who's safe in, uh, amongst us at the moment. What makes him special? Um, well, you know, they figure, you know, besides uh, bats in Wuhan, uh, Dave in Paris is probably the next repository of uh, most of this COVID and any mutations that may come. So we'll figure give him a shot. But no, he works at uh, Scarborough Grace, uh, you know, every week or every other week, something like that. So I guess if you're, if you had a name tag, you can line up and get a shot. So, mm, okay. Yeah. Mm. Cool. So there you go. But us poor schlepping pharmacists that see how many hundreds of patients every day, uh, you know, close up and personal. No, we don't get one. So. <laughs> go figure. Well, apparently, the uh, the EMS workers from the ambulances aren't getting one either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hey, just, just on, 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 a, on that YouTube note, my wife follows one of these yoga girls from Austin, Texas. She has like 9 million followers and she makes about a thousand bucks a day. Not bad. How many followers? 9 million. 9 million. 9 million. Yeah. And that's a thousand bucks a day. So actually that's, that, you know, that's a pretty decent living. And what have we got here? Six. So, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, we're down to that penny thing, I think. <laughs> let's do the math here. I mean, we're, I guess we'll, we probably, if we had this going for a year on YouTube, we'd have like maybe nine followers, right? <laughs> so, what's uh, nine million over nine times a uh, thousand? Well, we'd make it mandatory, right? Membership to park means around. you have to watch the channel. Yeah. You get us another four members. <laughs> Uh, we start a pyramid uh, Ponzi scheme. There's somebody at the top and keep getting new people, but you got to pay a hundred bucks to get in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. I've got one over Christmas. You uh, send five people a bottle of wine, and at the end of the year, you get like 50 bottles of wine a day or something. I says, no, don't even get involved with this no. stuff. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Yeah, even if it was half work, it's still too much. Yeah, just go and buy the wine. Anyway. And uh, Dwayne, it looks like you were right on the money about purple. Yeah, that's the way it looks like. Yeah, yeah, you live in the most interesting state, it seems. So, well, maybe not the most interesting state. Uh, I came home after hearing nothing of today's events and uh, got the, the recap. <laughs> uh, you know, live in a little bubble there, but uh, yeah, that that that's maybe a slightly more interesting state uh, if DC is a state. So. You know, see what they're finding out now, and uh, I just saw a program before I came down, or some shots. Apparently, the ones inside the Capitol, uh, they're all Antifa boys. Hmm. <laughs> their, their email address is antifa.org. They've got pictures on them being Antifa, so they're they're playing the game a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Sir, are you hanging in tonight? Sorry, what, was that me? Yeah, are you taking in tonight or? Uh, want me, no, to, I mean, if, want me to start? Yeah, if you're if you're good with that, yeah. I mean, I don't oh, know. Yeah, no you, problem. Okay. Probably. Oh, we're getting close there. Yeah. Um, okay. I just I, I did want to actually just say one thing before we start. Uh, you yeah. know, thank you for uh, your. Uh, condolences, messages, and that. I didn't have a chance to um, respond. I just, I've kind of been offline uh, for the last couple of weeks. Uh, my mom passed away uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, so it's been a little, uh, little upside down to say the least. I've uh, been spending a lot of time with my dad who uh, survives her. And uh, um, so anyway, um, thank you all for your uh, well wishes and uh, thoughts is appreciated. And uh, I you know I could have just, you know, spent five seconds and uh, sent off a response but uh, it was definitely uh, uh, nice to uh, nice to see when it did come through. So thank you all for that. Okay, right. No, I'll... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ken. All right, so let's get started. Okay. <clears throat> well, 
Well, Happy New Year, everybody. Um, hope you got some uh, quality shack time uh, over the break and whatnot. I know from my perspective, uh, I messed around continuing on with my digital pot experiments, uh, and uh, that's going somewhat well, depending on which way you look at it, but it works, so that's the main thing. Uh, another thing I messed around with actually was today was a two-channel DC voltmeter I was doing because I acquired a, uh, a power supply, positive and negative uh, power, uh, voltage power supply. So I decided I wanted to do a voltmeter with it. So I started to mess around with some Arduino stuff today. And uh, well, I let the smoke out of one of the nanos. <laughs> and then that's when I thought it's time to go and make dinner. <laughs> so we'll go back at it later. Anyway, I didn't see anything, but I certainly smelt it. And uh, it's definitely not working any longer. <clears throat> and I did a little bit of FT8, but nothing too exciting. So uh, maybe as we go around later on or whatever, people can mention what, the, what they got up to. But uh, Dave will be long. He'll be a little bit late today. He'll be along shortly, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about long wire performance. So, uh, Klaus, do you have a, your? Uh, are you ready for tonight for a show us your shack uh, segment? Can't hear you. Well, your mic's muted. I uh, still can't hear you, uh, class. You're showing muted. There you Sorry, go. Sorry, that makes sense. Yeah, I got a couple of pieces. Uh, I just pulled them off, and they're uh, they're like old style uh, radio stuff. Maybe people are interested in that. Um, if I show you my whole shack, I got nothing left for the next pre presentation. So I'll, I'll throw you some Heathkit stuff. I did some Heathkit building when I was younger. Uh, didn't get my radio license, so I didn't make use from them uh, much, other than to uh, listen on the uh, on the the bands and trying to pick something up. But I did build them, and I did get a big, massive kick out of it. Anyway, uh, let me turn this thing around. I don't know if you're going to be able to see anything. Okay, this thing works backwards. I don't know how this thing works now. There we go. So the bottom one is a, a Heathkit SS10, uh, sorry, it's a um, SB220. It's a linear amplifier and it's good for uh, 80, 40, 20, 50, uh, 15 uh, meters. It uh, The input power was 100 watts. It's a vintage 1970. I think it's 1975. They brought the thing out. Um, it's uh, the maximum input power is uh, 2000 watts on SSB, 1000 watts on CW, and 1000 watts on uh, RTTY. So I guess there's no low voltage or no low power uh, CW on this thing. Uh, they're fun to work on. It gives you all kinds of warnings. The uh, the high voltage inside the cabin is about 3,000 volts. So you want to make sure that all your grounding and uh, you keep, uh, you know, at least one hand in your pocket. Because if you hit the sucker, it's it's really going to hurt you. There you go. It's, it's quite a nice, interesting piece. I don't know if it works. Apparently the tubes go on this thing quite often. And they're very hard to get. But it's it's a nice uh, it's a nice shelf queen. Uh, what they're looking for ideally is a 240 uh, volt line to power the sucker. But if you don't have that, 120 with uh, a number 10 wires will do too. So you have to upgrade your wiring if you want to run this thing. Uh, the unit on the top is an SB610, and they call that a uh, a uh, monitor scope. It uh, monitors the on-air signal and uh, it has a, a little oscilloscope screen on the top of it as you see and it's got a little blip that moves up and down. I've never really put a signal into it but that's the way it is. You can 
you can set uh, set all kinds of parameters with that to see how your station's doing. Uh, you can also monitor the other station's performance by uh, hooking it into uh, into your receiving side of the uh, of your receiver. Uh, it measures according to what I've written down. It measures uh, uh, the, the signal patterns. It measures the RF envelope, RF trapezoid, and RTTY cross pattern. If that means anything to anyone. Uh, it can accommodate up to a thousand watts, and uh, it's it's. I think it looks nice if you got it up there and you see a little green blip going. It's it's kind of interesting. I picked it up for nothing. Same with the one below that. So they're nice to have sitting around just for the heck of it, just to dream at when you're trying to get a signal. And that's about all I got. They're nice looking. Uh, that stuff still looks good today. You know, cause are you going to try to uh, restore it? Um, I think the I think they're both working. To be honest with you, because the guy that that gave it to me, he uh, he lost his hearing and his sight, and he had to go to an old fogey's home. But he had QSL cards all over his walls, and I mean, he had more equipment than you could shake a stick at. He was really he was really in the ham radio. He was an engineer for. Uh, for uh, some of the large paper companies, all dealing with their with their heavy equipment that they had, right. so he was quite into, he was quite good at uh, electrical stuff. Yeah, we have so, a, yeah, they're they're nice looking units, and I think they both still work. I mean, they, they power up, but somebody with some expertise would have to go through it. I've got the uh, the manuals for it, so I guess I could uh, I could check and see if if I'm getting voltages where I should be getting voltages. But when you're talking uh, three thousand dollars on the power supply for these tubes. Uh, you want to be very careful what you're getting into, and I'm really not that familiar with with that high voltage. So I think it's best left to people that that yeah. know what they're doing instead of me opening the sucker up. Yeah, we have a guy locally here who's uh, I think his main part of his hobby, uh, ham radio stuff, is actually uh, restoring Heathkit equipment, and uh, he's got a really really nice uh, nice collection, and the stuff looks absolutely pristine. So, but there's quite uh, there's quite a market out there, and uh, for that stuff. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, I just I just went on eBay just to get some information on the uh, on the amplifier, and they're they're looking to sell it for like nineteen hundred uh, Canadians, which I think is probably an outrageous price. But yeah, eBay kind of I think they throw prices out there and see what sticks. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think I think six seven hundred dollars for this thing. Not that I want to sell it, but I'm just saying it's it's. I think that's probably what the price on that is, in the condition that it's in. Well, the best way is hook it up and get a good. Uh, uh, dummy load on there and uh, see what happens. Uh, Ken, you got something to say today? Ask. Yeah, uh, Carl, if you're ever looking for tubes, I usually get my stuff from uh, Tubes Depot in the States and they carry new old stock. So, yeah, I, I picked up a box of about 25 different tubes when I picked up uh, some of this stuff. So, I've got some tubes, whether they are the tubes for this amplifier apparently they're very very hard to get and about the only place you can get one is out of china and they're very uh very iffy is what i'm what i'm finding out about this stuff yeah just uh before you go to china just google north america and see what you can come up with but i i've i've picked up a lot of heath kit tubes or tubes for heath kit stuff off tubes depot and uh be surprised they might have them in stock Oh, yeah, I'm, what, what I'm reading on these units is not so much the tubes that are the issue, it's the capacitors. They start to leak like crazy and you pretty well have to replace them after 20, 25 years because they are uh, they just had the biscuit. The, yeah, the guy locally here, he replaced everything. Capacitors, the resistors, but every single bit in there. Good thing he's retired. Uh, Al, you had a question? Yeah, that's close. I think uh, you'll enjoy that if you get it going. I'm running the SB200, which is the uh, 600 watt version. I just love it. Uh, you have to make a bit of an interface box to run with our solid state uh, uh, radio. Um, but uh, there is a website, I'll, I'll, I'll dig it up, but there's one website out there that specializes in uh, refurb kits for these amplifiers. They've got power supply boards, cap uh, kits, uh, everything you'd ever want to uh, uh, rebuild that, soft start modules, anything you want. Uh, I think it'd make a fine addition to your shack. Um, 
And you plan on selling it? Let me know, okay? <laughs> yeah, well, I have to figure out if I can hook my ICOM 7300 into this thing and maybe I'll get out somewhere. <laughs> okay, anybody else have any other questions? Okay, that's good. Uh, Dave, good evening. We can see you. Do you not want to talk? Side effect from the COVID shot is mute uh, and actually a little bit of deaf and definitely <clears throat> dumb. No, I have to find uh, I have to find a screen. I got about three or four screens open. Yes, good evening. I've had my COVID shot. Uh, so uh, I'm relatively, relatively normal. I only got one extra toe. <laughs> Very good. Excellent, Dave. So did you want to talk about your antenna tonight, your NFED? My NFED? Oh, sorry, your long wire. Yeah, I'm just trying to get my files moved over here to the... Okay, the you, want, you want another few more minutes? Yeah, because I just walked the door a little while ago from work. Okay, well, let's just do a little quick, just do a quick round table while we're, we're going on then. And uh, let's go with uh, Kevin, the other Kevin. HHA, or no, KHH. Yeah, Jeez. something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, oh, so you want to know what I'm doing? Um, yeah, pulling that. wires pulling wires in my shack and moving my server around and because I'm redoing my basement a bit. So not not much else happening other than getting ready to have another place to have my shack. Oh, okay. So next everything's disconnected. I'm, as I, you know, it, it's a process, right? I, yeah. So. So next month you'll be full of uh, interesting things you've done in the shack then instead of just rebuilding, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who's uh, hey Michael? Hey, you there, Michael? Uh, if you're trying to talk, you're muted. Uh, maybe he'll come back in a minute. Uh, Ken, any shack time be over the over the holidays? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's let's go on to uh, Dwayne. <laughs> Dwayne, did you get any shack time done this over the holidays? Oh, I've got a couple little projects working on. I just got in some uh, the section of semi rigid coax. I'm building a near field probe. Just got in a little uh, twenty dB amplifier. Make up some accessories to go with the uh, SA and uh, portable scope that I've got. Oh yeah, uh, cool stuff. Actually, I got one of those little uh, VNA boards or uh, amplifier boards, low noise amplifier boards. Should do that. Maybe that be a good thing for me to build as well. We won't let the smoke out of that one though. <laughs> How about you, Al? Turn the microphone on. Yep. Well, I guess I've been up to work. Um, what have I been doing? Um, I guess I've uh, dusted off my uh, vacuum tube uh, DC uh, radio again to see uh, if I can make a little more progress. Learning more than I ever cared to. <laughs> I don't have a lot of... Oh, you probably forget about it in six months. I know, I know. So uh, uh, I was studying a few things, uh, uh, trying to characterize a couple of the tubes now. So... Uh, uh, the project this week is to build a uh, a standalone seven pin uh, vacuum tube uh, breakout board. So I'm going to characterize the uh, uh, the, the tubes. Oh, um, an interesting conversation. Uh, maybe later in the year. Sure, think, sure. Give us a little talk about that. We've seen Dave characterize transistors. Actually, that's another thing we should talk about at some point, Dave. But anyway, uh, yeah, characterizing tubes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, what else is going on? Um, I think in the fall I was playing with some of that um, uh, iron-on uh, uh, negative uh, PC board uh, uh, resist film, and uh, oh. a couple of boards. I actually made a a board for the um, uh, the SNA uh, crystal fi fixture with good success. So uh, over the holidays, I I decided to make a, a dedicated uh, uh, UV light box. So ordered up some uh, some UV tubes that have uh, was it 368 nanometer uh, wavelength for a very fast exposing of this film. So uh, I'm going to dive into that a little bit and uh, 
it's been a while since I've done PC boards. Uh, I can think back over the last 30 years, and uh, it, it's gone from uh, nail polish to hacksaws to uh, photographic techniques. Uh, so this is reasonable. So I'm going to play with that. Awesome. Uh, you, you're going to have to dig. make sure you take some pictures. <clears throat> Yes. You know, and you can show us a quick uh, couple of uh, pictures there. Oh, I think Ken's got a question for you. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah. Uh, how how did you first try to turn out? Not bad. Not bad. Um, I, I don't think my uh, exposure was uh, quite right. Um, I, I took the uh, the negative and the exposed film uh and put it out in uh, daylight for half an hour, and that seemed to be a little too much. Uh, the areas that should have been uh, uh, blackened out uh, were starting to harden up, so I had a hard time developing the board. Uh, so I think just controlling the exposure and getting it right on would probably help a lot more. Uh, the only hassle I'm finding with this is um, this is a negative artwork process. Uh, I've used the uh, positive stuff from MG Chemicals before. And basically, you uh, you draw up a, a, a pattern, and what you see is what you get. Well, this time, I actually have to either draw in negative format or find a piece of software to uh, give me a negative image. Uh, so that's a little bit of a hassle, but... Um, can you not just your printer give you... On my printer, I have a little checkbox that says uh, print mirror. Negative or mirror? Mirror. Wouldn't mirror be a, a flip? flip? Yeah, it flips it around. So when you iron it on, or when you put it onto your board, it'll be correct. Yeah. You know, what, what I'm talking about is when I say negative is uh, instead of uh, having a piece of artwork with uh, uh, the traces being black, I have to have a black background and the traces being clear. Oh, oh. So you can do it with um, full Adobe, um, uh, was it a, a Adobe uh, Print Shop? Um, so depending on your software, it's uh, it's okay. I'm using AutoCAD, so uh, uh, it's good for large diameter thick traces because I'm actually drawing it. But a proper piece of software would probably make it a little bit easier. But uh, so far, so good. So I'm going to uh, do some samples and trials, and uh, I'll give you guys a report next week. Or not oh, yeah. Week. Yeah. yeah. Put something up on the uh, on our forum then. Yeah. See how it turned out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. All right. only, only one last thing I just wanted to mention. Um, I've had a couple of uh, SegGen boards, and I fully kitted them out. I really only need one, but I just thought I'd mention if anybody wants a complete SegGen, with all the parts, I, I do have one in stock uh, that's available. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to like the price because uh, by the time you do it uh, for low quantity and no subsidy, uh, it does get up around uh, you know, sixty, seventy dollars. But uh, I do have one if anybody's interested. Maybe do a posting on the group's I/O as well, Al. Yeah. Yeah. Ken, go ahead. That's all I've been up to. That's a lot. Ken? Yeah, I've got. I've got. Uh... When I picked up the stuff from Frank, uh, there was three uh, boards available. So but if anybody's board? looking for a board. Okay. Sig Gen you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe make mention on the group's I.O. because it you know, goes to a, a little bit larger audience. Yeah. Okay. Michael, are you back yet? Well, maybe he's having computer troubles. Good evening, Ms. Sen. Hello. So, you, get any, you get any productive time in the shack? Yes. So, well, first of all, I, I decided to clean the man cave by basically appropriating another room, making a second man cave, and moving all the good stuff into that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I can see how that works. Yeah. So, I, I got my soldering station set up, and I tried, I started doing that 45 watt amplifier board with the surface mount soldering. Yeah. So it worked, it, it actually is a lot easier than I thought it was. Um, if you apply flux in the right way and you just, you have a good soldering gun and get the right temperature, it's almost impossible not to get it to it. You just lob the solder on, drop the pieces on, 
it, you know, you apply the soldering gun, like just like putting a hair dryer to it, and it just melts and they align themselves perfectly. So yeah. the, the first video. Yeah, the first resistor was perfect. Then I did the other uh, two two components, and they were a bit trickier because you know blobs were everywhere, and they it was hard to. I think I put too much solder this time. Oh, so that's, that's what solder braid is for. What's that? That's what solder braid is for. Yeah, but the, so I use solder braid to take it off. But if you can apply just the right amount of paste the first time, it's easier. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't have a precision instrument. I just used a toothpick or something. Oh, okay. But, use, use very fine uh, solder. Yeah, I'm using paste this time. Yeah, but your solder make it really fine, so you don't yeah. have big huge blobs. Well, well you, you know, do. So. You know, actually, talking about the solder paste, I think I'm going to probably end up venturing into that one too, because I got a couple of components that I'm interested in and in, in messing around with, and uh, and you know that that's the was it a DFM package, and that's pretty hard to do from a. Uh, 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 you know the the way we've been kind of doing it now and solder paste it just might be the the answer anyway we'll probably tackle that one in, in, in the next couple of weeks um yeah. anyway dave i think uh, dave is ready so uh, i think we'll we'll turn it over to uh dave thought you said you were ready good thing we know sign language no, I've got too many screens open, and I have to find my um, <clears throat> my browser Ready. and unmute myself. So you guys could hear me okay, right? Yeah. Okay. Got to do, got to do that all at the same time, like walking, chewing gum. Yeah. So okay, let me start sharing my screen here. You know, all Dave needs is a smile and some sunglasses, and you do a good Stevie Wonder, I think, with that, uh, you know, looking up all the time. I like that. I'll keep quiet. Right, you are. Okay, so uh, you guys uh, uh, you guys can see my screen here, right? You should be able to see a Google map. Yep, that's good. Okay, so... That's kind of where I'm living. And uh, if we do a satellite view and we kind of zoom in, you'll see that I am in a narrow, small space where I am. There's not much room for me to put up an antenna. The house is here. Uh, that's an old photograph with, I guess, the old owner's car there in the driveway. So what I decided to do here to put an antenna up is that I was going to run a long wire around the perimeter of the house. And I didn't have time to do that right out of warm weather to, to do that. And uh, plus Kevin had to warn me about safety. You know, I don't want to fry my kid. <laughs> so anyway, so what I decided to do was to run the uh, long wire. I've got a long wire tuner and I've got pictures. I'll show you all this stuff. I just want to kind of show you the layout uh, so you can uh, kind of understand how the antenna runs. So it's a long wire antenna and it runs along the side of the house here, along this fence, along this fence here. And uh, there's a fence here, goes right along the fence, comes back along the fence. And right about here, it comes back across. And right in here, there's a trellis. It goes uh, midway along the trellis. This fence is about, you know, five to six feet. This part of the fence, it's five feet. This part of the fence over here, it's about six feet. And so the, um, as a test, I decided to put the antenna up and just see how well it uh, performs. And right over here is I put a ground plane in and I took some chicken wire, approximately about 100 square feet of uh, chicken wire, and I've got it that on the ground. And I got stones and dirt and stuff on it. And that becomes kind of my ground plane instead of running radials, because normally you'd want to run radials with this with this antenna because it needs to have a good um, a ground plane uh, to act uh, uh, upon right 
So any questions so far? Pretty straightforward. So uh, if we start, uh, um, let me start going through. So basically what I have is I have an ICOM age four remote antenna tuner, and that tunes from uh, anywhere from 80 meters right up to uh, 30 meter, um, 10 meters, uh, 30 megahertz. Um, it does. It says it cannot tune 160 meters, and uh, I have in fact confirmed that you get a fairly high SWR. I chose 200 feet, uh, 203 feet of wire because with a long wire antenna, you want to choose a length that's non-resident on any band you're gonna be operating it on. And uh, so at 203 feet, that allows me to be resonant, to be not resonant, but to be able to use the 80 meter band right up to the 10 meter band. And the antenna is about six feet off the ground, as I said, for testing. I've got about hundred square feet of chicken wire as my ground, um, ground plane. And I also have a four foot ground spike in the ground that's more for static. And I've got two eight foot radials. It's just wire I had on hand. So I just ran two eight foot radials off of the ground spike uh, parallel to the uh, chicken wire. I just, I just had some wire, some copper wire, and I just threw it in the ground. I thought, let me try and get as much wire on the ground as I could for my uh, ground plane. So here's where the antenna um, comes out of the house. Uh, the antenna, and the, I've got twisted pair here. You can see the beige twisted pair. That's what's actually tuning, uh, controlling the antenna tuner. So my wire comes out, goes into a remote antenna switch. Later on, I'm gonna add another antenna, probably my vertical. So right now it's only switched to one of the ports I've got. It's a four port switch that I can tune remotely. And so that runs along behind the air, air conditioner here, along here and goes to the tuner. Here's the tuner here. There's the uh, uh, twisted pair wire. It's outdoor grade twisted pair wire that uh, runs to the tuner. And that's what uh, actually um, uh, gets the tuner to, uh, to kick in and start tuning. You can actually see the wire and the antenna wire there. You, I don't know if you could see that clearly, the gray wire. Uh, you could see the ground spike there. There's my ground spike. And you could see the two copper radials. They're, they're approximately five or six feet in length. And here you could see the attachment where I've got it attached to the chicken wire mesh. And I've also got a copper wire run along the entire distance of the mesh and I've got it soldered to various places just to make sure I it's it's completely um, connected together because it's I think it's about three pieces, three sections of mesh, and uh, where the mesh ov overlap eventually in time, you know that's going to corrode. So I decided to solder uh, these uh, this ground uh, this copper wire to it, and then the black things are coax seal. I put so that the solder joint doesn't corrode. Uh, Dave, question? Yep. What are the copper radials for? It just, you, you need a counterpoise for, for this antenna. I just put it down because I wanted, I wasn't sure whether the 100 square feet of mesh would would be good enough as a, as a, cop, as a ground plane. So I just threw that down just because I had the wire. There was no reason to go, specific reason to go and put it down. But here you could see a closer look at uh, the copper wire where it's soldered to the mesh and uh, the um, coaxial. I've got that uh, down. And so now you could see the wire running along the house here through this window. Uh, uh, past this window, then it goes up to this point here. It's kind of arcing up to, to, to this point. It runs along the fence there, then it runs along this fence here. 
And here you can see the wire running along the fence to the other side of the fence and along the fence uh, there. And then the, the ground plane is here. The canoe sitting on top of the ground plane there. So I, again, this is a test. This is not a permanent antenna. I just want to test the uh, tuner to make sure it's working and just to see, you know, whether this antenna, this low to the ground, whether it would actually work. And also too, I wanted to check the fields coming off of uh, the antenna and I've been doing that and I'll do a subsequent presentation on the fields coming off of this antenna. So here you can see the wire coming across uh, from the fence to the um, trellis here. And you know, you could basically walk up and touch this wire. And so my motto is safety, we don't need no stinking safety. You so you know, lightning grounds, do you? Yeah, so I you know, I again it's a test setup. So the way I tested the the antenna um, was I ran a CW message using Digital Master 780. I don't know CW if it comes up and bites me. I have no idea. So all I do, I programmed, I set up Digital Master 780 to send out CW test DEV 30IK. And I did that at 20 words per minute. And I ran that. I did, I think I did about 10 messages of that. Uh, and the reason I did that is because Reverse Beacon will pick up this message. You could also do a CW, but the problem is if I call CW, someone might answer it. So I decided to just do a test, a message. And uh, the reason I did this is that the Reverse Beacon will pick this up. And there are beacons, you know, uh, there are spotters all over uh, Canada and the US and, uh, you know, across in, uh, in Europe that could pick up my signal and tell me what, uh, how strong the signal is. I also tried running Whisper as well from WSJT software. And uh, you know what? I got extremely favorable results. I just, I couldn't believe how well this antenna works. And on the weekend, I was able to make two contacts, three contacts on the weekend. Saturday, uh, Peter and I were playing around and I was able to make uh, a few contacts and uh, no animals were, were fried uh, during this test. So here's the results from, and I've got this in a spreadsheet that I could pull up. Um, you could get more detail because what I did, I got the, the um, uh, azimuth where um, the angle of which this is to me so I could understand distance and as well as uh, directionality of the antenna. So I've got that in the spreadsheet, but these are the stations I got on uh, 2.49. What's, is that 180 meters? What's 2.49? Oh no, that's 21, sorry. That's 21 megahertz and that's 24 megahertz. That's 24 megahertz. Sorry, sorry, I thought it was 2.4 megahertz. I was going, what the, what the hell was I doing? So that's a 24 megahertz. So I, one, one station picked me up 6 dB over the noise floor, which is pretty darn good. You know, here on 21 megahertz, uh, 14. Uh, v6, that's a, um, where's F8? Is that a, is that a US? No, that fakes uh, France. France, okay. So France picked me up there. Uh, VE6, that's Calgary, right? Or Alberta. It could be Edmonton, too. Yeah, oh, well, well, Alberta. Sorry, Alberta. Yes, Alberta. Yeah, it's Alberta. Yeah, so here's on um, on 80 meters. Again, pretty good signal-to-noise ratio here. So it looks as if the antenna, you know, transmits fairly well. Here it is on 40 meters. And uh, uh, Peter, one of the interesting things on 40 meters you'll see in my spreadsheet is some of these stations were at 90 degrees to me, which you're about 90 degrees to me. 
We had trouble with 40. But it just this day, maybe 40 was open, right, for these stations. And for you, maybe 40 was closed or just the noise floor was too high. Because I think, did you not hear me on 40? I can't remember if I barely heard you on 40 or 80, one of the two. Uh, you know what? It was probably 40 that I barely heard you on because the noise floor was really high on 80. Yeah, yeah. And so here's on 10. OL7, where is that? That's um, Iceland. That's Iceland. Here's another French station. So you can see I'm getting pretty good uh, DX. No, TF is Iceland. I, I Yeah, there's TF. TF. Yeah, Iceland. OL, I think, might is that Belgium maybe? I don't know. I've got it listed where it is um, on my spreadsheet, but I was able to get across to Iceland, 8 dB above the noise floor which, you know, I think that's pretty damn good, right? And uh, for contacts, these are contacts I made. So on uh, 80, uh, sorry, 40 meters, I made two contacts, two US contacts. Here's the azimuth. So Peter, you're at 67 degrees to me. You're about 327 kilometers away. So, and there's a signal to noise ratio. This is the SNR that got reported back to me. Peter, you reported you were hearing me at, at plus four. I just know it was just, and I said plus four, but it was, it was remarkable the difference between uh, what we heard you at 60 meters compared to 40 and 80. You know, like 80 was impossible, 40 was a struggle. Well, it was impossible really, but 60 was, well, we could have carried on a conversation. We should yeah. have had sideband, but oh well. Yeah, it was, you were just booming in. You were coming in really well. You know, and so this kind of concludes the slide portion. So the, the bad news for this antenna is noise. Like there, I'm pegged at S9 on 80, on uh, 40 meters. Right here it is. Uh, you know, it's a little bit just below S9. Here on 80, it's just below it's just just below S9. So just the noise floor is just nuts with this antenna I'm picking up all kinds of noise. And I've heard that these long wire and an antennas, they're notorious for picking up noise from anything that the neighbor has. Your neighbors will have if they've got a you know a cordless drill or anything in the house, it's going to pick it up as noise. Even the uh, some of the, the smart meters too. Uh, Klaus has a question for you, Dave. Sure, Klaus, go ahead. I can't see who's got hands up. Go ahead, Klaus. Sorry. I guess I would hope I turn it on. I think your problem with noise is you're really close to the ground. But have you tried putting a uh, a ferrite uh, coil around the wire just to try and get rid of the noise a little bit? No, I've, I have ordered the, the other problem I've got, which I don't mention here, is I have got a lot of RF in the shack. And in some cases, I'll pop a breaker. And uh, uh, let me, yeah, and I'll pop breakers just because of the RFI coming back into the, the shack. Uh, let me see, do I have, yeah, here's my, where's my? You may have a lot of trouble trying to stop that breaker from, from tripping, Dave, because uh, Kingston Dave has, uh, has uh, he's cured of most of it, but it still trips on him every once in a while. Yeah, I'm just trying to find my uh, results. It might be in this reverse beacon file here. Let me see if it's in this file here. Hopefully this thing loads. Again, I don't have Microsoft Office loaded on this computer and I have to use Open Office and it sucks. See, like I get shit like this, you know, like for God's sakes, man. Yeah, here's where I've got, uh, no, this is not the file. No, what do I do with the, where did I put the file? I 
looks as if I don't the file didn't get transferred to this PC. I don't think it's whisper testing. Yeah, no, this is my whisper results. So here it is on 160 meters. Here you can see the azimuth. You know, and, and Peter, I think I, I don't know why I highlighted that as yellow. Oh, I highlighted um, um, uh, V3, so uh, Ontario. I just highlighted Ontario stations that I was able to contact and whisper. Here's on 40 meters. So Peter here, if you look at the azimuth here, 52, 150, 415 kilometers, that's, you may know this guy. This guy's probably out of Kingston Way. I don't know if you know this, this, this person, because he's got to be out near you. I figured you must know everyone in that area. Yeah, right. Yeah. It might be out in Brockville. Yeah, so here's another some more testing and here's on 30 meters. So you see the antenna is getting out. You know, it's actually working fairly well. And uh, here's 17, 15. And if I go anything above 15, that's when I got a lot of RF uh, coming back into the shack. And typically I'll pop a breaker. So I, so Klaus, coming back to your question, I did order some ferrite beads. I haven't gotten them yet. No, not ferrite beads, some ferrite uh, chokes to go on my, my cable, uh, my coax cable to choke off the RFI because these long wire antennas too, if you don't have a good and ideal ground, that's typically a symptom. You get RFI coming back into the shack. Just quickly looking here with, uh, how are you grounding your station? Yeah, as I said, it's a, I've got, you mean ground for what, like for antenna ground plane? No, or? no, no, the station ground itself. Are you are you taking all of your uh, all of your equipment to a single point? Sure. And, yeah. uh, grounding that single point outside? Nope, it's not grounded outside. That's maybe your problem. No, why, why would that cause noise? Because what you're... You're not grounded. All you're doing is grounding the antenna. You should have all your equipment grounded too. That's why you have grounding screws in the back. Right. Everything is a common ground within my shack. It's connected to the household ground. No, you don't want to do that. You want to have a separate ground. You want to have make sure that everything goes to a common point. Uh, I've but, got a bus bar, but so but, you don't end up with ground loops, and that's grounded outside to, uh, the cost to Earth. For me to run a wire from where I am outside, okay, that's a long wire, okay, and that wire is gonna have inductance. And so that is gonna not gonna be the path that it's gonna take to ground. It's gonna go back to my household ground. It'll always go back to my household ground because uh, it's the closest <laughs> ground. It's gonna have to go there eventually. Otherwise, you, you, it, matter of fact, if you do not bond your RF ground eventually back at the panel, that's where mine is bonded back at the panel. You must do that. It, it's illegal not to. And if you don't bond it, then you're gonna have you you're risking a potential difference. Two two different grounds in a house in one dwelling is not legal, and you could uh, you could have a potential difference between the two grounds. Right. That's that's for safety. That's for electrical safety. Correct. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens, Dave, uh, when you, you raise it up in the air a little bit higher, although how much higher can you get? Well, I, gonna, my plan is to get it up at uh, five meters above um, the ground. So it's going up like uh, 15, 20 feet in the air. That's the highest I can get it up. Okay. So if you, by the way, Dave, is up near, it's in between Arm Prior and Ottawa on the Ottawa River. So I ran some simulations of, of the antenna. This is the far field pattern. I don't like using this. I like using the 3D plot. So if I look at the, um, the pattern, this is at 14 megahertz. Okay, so this is south. This part of the house is pointing south. This is pointing north. 
okay, with the antenna, with the ground plane I've got, you could see that the I'm getting some gain in what's that? That's the north uh, northeast. Uh, which is north again? X. You oh, know, no, sorry. This is north. So that's the southeast. See, I'm getting some gain in the southeast, and so I'm also getting seaboard. a little bit of gain here in the northwest. Northwest. So pointing north, right? Yeah. The x-axis here is pointing north. So you can see there it's favoring a, a kind of a, a a westerly and an easterly heading, right? Azimuth, it's, it's favoring that. And that's what I'm seeing on the, um, the um, performance I'm getting, the contacts. And I wish I could get that spreadsheet where I've got all the uh, contacts listed. I don't know where it is, but you know that's what I'm seeing now. If I go over to uh, if I go over to say seven megahertz, see most of the radiation is going straight up, and the other thing is notice I there's no gain. I'm actually losing energy, and if you look at the efficiency, your other stuff, Dave. Yeah, right. Perfect. That's right. So if you look at the efficiency of the antenna, only 10% of the energy that's being fed into the antenna is being radiated. Wow. This, this, is, this is not correct. There's a problem there. Uh, I've read that this is also accounting for like losses in the ground. So this is not radiated power, is not correct. It's actually taking the overall efficiency of the antenna. So it's it's taking it's taking how much um, energy the antenna will actually take in. This is actually telling you how much energy is actually radiating into the atmosphere. So only 10%. So out of 100 watts, out of 100 watts, only 10 watts is being radiated. And that is also um, uh, agrees with what comments I've heard about long wire antennas. They're not very efficient. They work, but they're not very <coughs> efficient. And I think if I go back to 14, you'll see I'll get the same, same efficiency. I get a little bit higher and get 26. And it's probably because it's a higher frequency it can be a little bit lower to the ground because the wavelength is uh, shorter, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm getting a little bit more. I'm getting 26 watts coming out. And this is now, this is in theory. Well, between you messing around with Whisper and FT8 and stuff like that, you'll probably easily confirm or deny what you've, uh, your theoretical stuff is saying, Dave. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, what I've been trying to do is get the, um, I don't, man, where, I don't know where I put that file. It's going to drive me crazy now. I think you're letting your job get in the way of ham radio. Yeah, maybe. Nope, that's not it. No, anyway, I can't, I don't know where it is. It's somewhere. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't have enough time to prepare for this to get the, all the files over on this uh, computer. So let me, uh, how do I, I gotta turn this off, right? We're back. Oh, that's great, Dave. Thank you. Anybody have any questions, uh, comments uh, for Dave? Yes, sir. So, uh, what what kind of power do you need to uh, drive that antenna tuner? I think it's about five watts. You need about five watts to go and drive it. Okay. It's five or ten watts, something like like that. All right. 
But yeah. it's the same thing with the other tuner I've got. I've got another tuner, and it's also about the same. It takes about 10 watts to go and drive it. But what I'll do for QRP is I'll tune up my ICOM and tune it to the frequency of the QRP radial, and I'll tune it up using my ICOM. Then I'll switch the antenna over to my QRP radial and then use it. Speaking of uh, auto tuners and stuff like that, did anybody order that auto tuner kit we were talking about last month? Yep, yep, yep. You did, did you? Okay. Did you get it yet? No, 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 no. I didn't order it. Someone had asked about two months ago. I uh, had brought it up in on the forum there. And I told them to be careful because there's... A it was a decent price. Anyway. Recording is on. I ordered one and got it in. I haven't put it together yet. Okay. Well, it'll be interesting to hear how it, uh, how it works out because, uh, you, you, boy, you can't beat the price. Yeah, let, let us know there, Dwayne. <clears throat> Any other comments, questions? Yeah, I had a comment for, for Dave. I read somewhere that if you want to have good grounding, you have to pound, I think, eight foot radials into the ground in like a you know, 10 by 10 foot, 10 by 10 grid or something around, or, or actually that's where a vertical is now. But they say chicken wire doesn't work at all. So I think what might be happening is the chicken wire is increasing the resistive losses in your antenna. So the, the antenna efficiency is just a, a measure of how much it absorbs uh, how resonant it is, how much it absorbs power going in. If you surround it with ferrites or something or iron filings, all of it, there'll be losses across the board. And so the efficiency may be close to 100%, but the radiation efficiency will be zero. And that might be what's going on. Your, your ground plane is just absorbing stuff, but you know, as far as radiation goes, it's not helping much. It may yeah, be fine. The directivity of your antenna somewhat which makes it uh makes it functional but it's something that maybe is still suboptimal yeah so when i had uh back at my other house i had a i did have bonded i did have a 10 foot like outside my shack i had a 10 foot rod driven in because i think the the code says you can either put a plate in the ground and there's a certain size plate you have to put in or you can put a 10 foot rod in so i drove a 10 foot rod and that rod i had it bonded to my electrical panel and that you do for electrical safety okay at my tower i also had the tower in the ground there was a ground rod at the base of the tower right and then i had another 10 foot radio another 10 foot um stake that was uh i think about 10 feet out because you're right, there has to be, and I think Peter would know this better than me, but you have to have your ground spikes out uh, because it has to do with the potential of the ground. It's got to be far enough away so you're not getting the same potential or some, I don't know, something like, like that. But that's what I did. But my antenna tower was never grounded to my um, household ground. It's supposed to be bonded, but I never did that. But as far as I know, and I have not heard a, uh, an explanation of why RF magically goes into the ground. As far as I know, grounding, putting a rod in the ground is for electrical safety and to keep a common potential so you don't get ground loops. So, well, the soil has a certain impedance, and so it will absorb RF. Um, yeah, but why? I don't understand how the Earth... So tell me about an airplane. A, an airplane flies, it's got a radial, and it it radiates, and it, it receives, but it's not magically connected to the Earth. Your car, it's on rubber wheels. It's not magically... It's not connected to the ground. Half-wave so, antenna. But but the body of the car is the ground plane. Right. So as I, what I understand, the only reason why you need the ground, the earth ground, is because 
when you radiate, it reflects off of the earth, comes up, and it constructively or de destructively combines with the uh, radiation coming off the antenna. And for a dipole, that's why you get that nice donut shape. It's because you've got a half a wavelength up and the, the reflection coming up from the earth, you know, um, interferes with the pattern and you get this nice donut. Uh, if someone, if I, my understanding's incorrect, I'd love to get a, a good explanation. I'd love to hear a good explanation. Might be in that antenna, the AWR antenna handbook. I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that, Dave. And certainly if I read about it, I can't remember it and have to reread. Uh, Klaus, do you have something to uh, comment on? Yeah, just with uh, with Dave's analogy there, it's it's an airplane has a ground, a car has a ground. It's totally separate from the ground on the earth. The whole electrical system, uh, if you have big, massive transformers, one side of those transformers are grounded. So that's how you're getting back to the ground. The whole system is grounded. Whereas with a car, it isn't. You've got your your metal your metal casing. It's the ground. So basically, that's it's, that's so. So that's it doesn't, correct. you're not using the right thing here. I, the electrical that's, system is grounded. That's what I call a ground plane. Yeah, that's right, which is totally a separate. The, the airplane body is a ground plane. Right. So it has are, nothing, to, it shouldn't have anything to do with the earth because that's, there's nothing connected to the earth because they're right. not. Uh, Why do I magically have to have a stake in the ground for RF? Well, Looks that's like because, I don't know what for RF, but for the electrical is because the whole electrical system is grounded. Yeah, for it's for electrical safety. So making sure everything's at the same potential and you don't electrocute yourself. Yeah, it sounds like you're right. It's, it's for, for lightning safety. But if you bury a car in your backyard, that would be all you need. That would be sufficient as a receiving ground. All you need is a constant potential surface that's large enough relative to your antenna. That's right. Ground. So now, now do you understand why I put the ground wire down? Right. It makes sense now. now. There's more to it than that. There's a there is the uh, building ground or, or, or you know the 120 volt ground, and there's also an RF ground, and you need both. So, but it looks like we're going to have to do some reading in uh, in the books to to really refresh one's memory on the why. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you still, need both. I'm still waiting to hear an explanation of why you need a ground stake in the ground for RF. I have, uh, hi, Barney. Yeah. <laughs> was that her, was she bringing, can, was she bringing can of beer? <laughs> place place yeah. your orders. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> place and your orders. Answer questions. <laughs> yeah, so, you know what, that, I'm throwing it out there. If someone wants to give a presentation, on this and clarify this, I would absolutely love to get an explanation. So I remember one thing, telegraph wires, they used to have two wires and then they realized you just need one and then both ends have to be grounded to the same planet, the same earth. And that's, and, and that's essential for telegraph. So maybe they just carried over the same thinking when it came to RF. Yeah, I have lots of questions about this. I, I don't I, Anyway, another topic. Let's not get into this grounding. Uh, there's too many pages in here to read. Dave, go, or, uh, sorry, um, Ken. Hey, while you're waiting for your fer ferrites to come in, uh, why don't you what? just make yourself a choke out of uh, RG8? I, I did actually do that in the basement, I've got a coil of wire, because what I did, you know where the, the antenna comes in the wall? On the other side of the house, I've got a coil of wire. I think, I don't know how many turns I've got. I've got uh, maybe six or seven turns, and I've got it um, tie wrapped. So it's a tight radius. It's a, it's a constant radius. And I thought that would act as a choke as well. But I still get RF. I've got, I bought the, um, I don't know if you guys could see it. I bought an RF meter here. I, I just got this this week and I've been playing around with it. And I've been checking the RF in my house. And uh, there is actually RF coming in. It's it's on the coax braid. 
hundred percent. And even after that joke I made, Ken, there's there's still RF uh, coming in. So I think I probably have to add more turns to it. Yeah, I think I made one a couple of years ago, and I had to use I don't know how many turns, close to twenty, for it to actually work correctly. Yeah, I don't have anything. I think I've got maybe about five or six. But I, I went to, um, there's a website, I think it's Polymer Engineering, and they do a whole bunch of RF stuff, and they've got Fairlight Choke for, specifically for R, R, RF. And it's a, a clamp on, that clamps on the um, coax, and uh, they sell a kit of 10 of these, and uh, that, that'll attenuate anything from, I think, one to 300 megahertz or something like that. I can't remember the specs, but it's within the frequency range I'm going to be using. So I figured with that, coupled with the coils I've got, hopefully I'll, I won't have RF coming back in the shaft. But coming back to the grounding, there's no way I can bond the ground outside there to my electrical ground unless I ground it to the AC, the AC unit there, because that will be tied to my electrical ground but I'd have to run a wire going to that ground and that wire is going to be long and that's going to have inductance, right? Isn't, and is not going to defeat, Peter, is not going to defeat the purpose of grounding? Because when you bond your, your grounding together, is there a limit to length of copper you use? We you limit the length from where to where. Like, okay, when you're bonding to, um, Sorry, I'm, I'm monopolizing the meeting here. But if you've got two ground points, like two ground stakes, two points of ground. Are you talking about for building ground, 110 volt? Building, ground. Yeah, building safety ground. Uh, you Generally, you drive two ground rods in your gro and you drive them 10 feet apart. Right, but but is there now, if, if I have a ground rod, one ground rod and another ground rod 100 feet away, do, is it practical to bond those grounds together? Uh, not too much. Because you know, <laughs> with my previous life, I mean, we were we would we would drive them ten feet apart. Yeah, but but the 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 ground I have outside my antenna and my building ground is at completely opposite sides of the of of the property. Yeah, the way you would find out is when you get if you have a megger and then you megger between and see what you've got, right? <clears throat> but so that's what that's why I'm saying I'm not sure whether I run a, a separate copper ground wire from my shack going outside to the antenna if that's going to make a difference. I don't think it's going to make a difference. Oh, I see what you did. No, I just brought no. I actually I bought it. I brought the. Uh, I brought my the what I when I joined the ground rods for the RF. And for the tower, I brought that into the house, and I and I bonded that to the ground wire at the right at the panel. How far is your tower from the house? Foot. Oh, okay. So, yeah, okay. So, in that case, so about three feet. It makes sense to bond it because it's a short distance, right? But if you had your antenna like in your old house, a mile away. It, does it make sense to go and bond the two grounds? I don't know. I've never thought about it before. Because they're too far away, and the amount of copper you're going to run. I think I would, uh, off the top of my head, I think I would just probably uh, uh, bond the tower remotely because it's because of the distance. But I, you know what? I have to think about that one. Because uh, I think the only thing, a reason I could think of bonding your tower to the household building ground is for um, lightning. Where I would get concerned is if you had power out there, and if you got the remote uh, antenna, t um, road antenna tuner out there, then you got power, right? But yeah, but it's going through the coax. So I think somebody else raised their hand here for a question, but I didn't quite catch who it was. I think it was Klaus. Was it okay? I didn't have a question, just a comment. When I was building my setup here, I was uh, sort of like told by people that in the know and. Uh, 
the internet books that uh, any long distance of grounding would turn the grounding wire into an antenna. So you really don't want to do that. Like if you had your shack at the second floor and you're bringing a cable down, if it was over 20, 25 feet, you'd had a, you've got another issue because now that grounding wire turns into an antenna all on its own because it's just too long. So what did they suggest you do then if you have to do that? Keep it short. <laughs> But maybe you can't. So how would you run a how would you run an RF ground if you're 30 feet up in the air? I don't know if you could or not. You might have to. Uh, I don't know. I didn't get into that deep because I didn't need 30 feet. Yeah. <laughs> Al, go ahead. See my shock. This is what what I use for my grounding. I use braid to keep. Yeah. The RF to keep. needs the braid. Uh, Al, Al, you got a question? Comment? A common question, but uh, uh, along the ground line. Um, if you uh, insulated it and put a, a ferrite um, uh, core on it and made a, a common mode choke out of it, wouldn't that uh, work? That's what we do with the, the coax. When you just wind some coax around a, a ferrite, you're trying to stop RF traveling on the outside conductor of the coax. Can you do that with a, a, a ground line? Sure, why not? I don't know. <laughs> Don't want to get RF off of it. That'll be a DC ground. Uh, what I call it, I don't know if it, there's such a thing, but that would be kind of like a DC static safety ground, right? Or a 60 cycle ground, you're talking. Uh, Hassan, was it you that had your hand up? Yeah, I think I, I might have an answer to Dave's question. Around your antenna, there's an electric field from end to end. Let's say it's 100 volts per meter. That field also penetrates into the ground. So what happens is between, if you're standing with your legs one meter apart, there's a hundred volts of difference between your two shoes. And that's the problem. So yes, where the dividing line is. Yeah, and if it, it gets worse that if there's a copper pipe in the ground, actually for, forget that. Let's say that there's you know, there's a deck chair six feet across and two legs on the ground and it's metal, it'll have 600 volts between the legs. So the purpose of the grounding is to is basically, it's in contact with the soil at all points. And be, I mean, a metal can only have a zero volts electric field across it because any charge dis imbalance equalizes instantly at the speed of light. So if you put a metal mesh in the ground and it's in touch with the soil at all points and there's good, con you know, the good interface and soil conductivity is all right, it will make sure that you cannot have any potential difference across any part of the ground. I think that's the whole point. And then the thing is, that, that works if the soil conditions are right and if there's no inductance in the wires. It'll slowly, you know, the, the DC, at the, at DC at zero frequency, it'll slowly stabilize. If you have a lightning strike, at that point, you have a potential difference that comes up within a nanosecond. And the inductance of the wire limits the speed at which currents can flow and the voltages can equalize. And that means it's useless for the lightning strike. And so for that, you want low inductance and you want a whole bunch of other properties to make sure that it, it functions on the ground in that, in, that, at that, at that, in that short time frame. But the, the interesting thing, Hassan, is that I did some experiments with my, my next presentation. I'll talk about this. I made some presentation, uh, some measurements with my field meter here, and there's absolutely no field on the ground plane. Zero. It's nothing is there. There's absolutely no field. Just, just connect that mesh and see what, what it does for your noise floor, Dave. Uh, Al, you had a comment? <laughs> More of a wisecrack, but I think Hassan was trying to tell us in a, in a lightning storm, don't be caught uh, sideways to a strike with your legs apart. Otherwise, uh, you're going to uh, uh, end up in uh, a shock between your legs. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Don't be, don't be sideways to the strike, <laughs> or or be sideways to the strike. Which one is it? Maybe we should well, see. The distance along the uh, uh, radially from the lightning strike. That's why they say uh, sometimes uh, lightning strike in a cow pasture. All the cows that were facing the lightning strike uh, got zapped, and the ones that were uh, standing laterally or on one foot, if they could, uh, were just fine. <laughs> hey, Eric, did you buy that book?
I think also Kevin had, had his hand up for a while. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just, there's a whole chapter on this in the back of the ARL book. Um, I mean, from, and the all, we're all, I think we're all talking about several different things here and trying to lump them all into one sort of overarching thing. And, and you're right, there's, there's one thing about safety and you must, you must bond external grounds to your internal house ground. That's, that's a safety thing. You have to do it, whether you pick up noise or not, it's dangerous. And if your house catches on fire because of a lightning strike and it blows everything up, your insurance won't pay, right? I mean, that's if they find out. So you have to bond it. And even in the ARL book, they even talk about doing that. And to the point about picking up noise, well, Dave, you're saying if it's an inductor, well, then it's an impedance and it's not gonna pick up much noise. And the longer it is, the less noise it's going to pick up because there's more inductance, right? So, and you're right to use, a, you know, if you want to make it low RF impedance, you have to have braid or flat copper strap, right? But uh, that's one thing I am doing in my shack because I wasn't done properly before. And I've got a number six, uh, seven strand ground running from the pipe, the actual water pipe. I run it into my shack and then I'm going to extend that out to, you know, if I, I have a couple of ground um, stakes I'm going to put in and it's going to go outside to that. And I'm going to strip the coax on all my incoming coaxes and I'm going to put bonding shields and ground them to my to the bonding on my, um, my ground cable that's going to the water pipe. So if I have anything coming in on, on my coax, it's going to go to, it's got to go to ground first before it gets to my radios. And that's that's what I'm planning on doing. So if I have problems, I'll let you know. <laughs> Actually, you know what? It's going to be interesting uh, because you it results because Kevin, you you know exactly what your noise floor is like now or was before you tore your shack all apart because you had very very high noise levels and see if you make a difference because you haven't changed location. You all you've changed is your uh, your grounding, right? I yeah, yeah. I, I think the noise is more a function of the type of antenna and you know, and what's around you, but uh, we'll fi I'll find out. I don't see, think, it's, to be honest, I don't think it's going to make a difference to the noise, and you but see, I just want something that's safe. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, Kevin, because one of the things I wanted, I was going to do was connect the antenna ground to the AC unit out, outside, because that's got to be grounded, right, to the household ground. Yeah. Right? So I figured if I connect that, it'd be going back to the ground. However, I, I didn't, I was reluctant to do that because that's got a motor running, right? Yeah, so a ground, a ground theoretically never carries current unless there's a fault. So unless there's leakage from your motor, there really should be no noise on it. Yeah. I mean, even even industrial factories, I mean, you know, the working with a lot of like CNC machines and all this kind of stuff, you know, the way they protect them nowadays is, you know, you basically take a giant, you make a giant grid of ground cables in the factory. You bond all the columns. You you know, CAD weld the bonds and CAD weld the ground wires, and and you make a giant grid so that if lightning strikes the building anywhere, the whole building voltage goes up and down together, and you don't have dis disparate voltages from one end of building to the other. Now I know you're going to say it's high frequency and all that, but it, it's still better than having different grounds at one end of the building compared to the other because the resistance of the ground is a lot higher than the impedance of some wire. Yeah. Class, do you have a question, comment? Yeah, it's a nice little project for some of us that uh, have spare time, a nice little thesis on uh, on proper grounding <laughs> for, uh, for park members. And that way we can all look at it and scrutinize it. Because like Kevin said, we're all talking little different little uh, parts of this thing, but we don't seem to have the overall picture. So maybe if uh, we could put something forward, maybe three, four of us and do some research and then we can all hash it over in a couple of meetings and say, yeah, this is the proper grounding that we should be, uh, we should be doing and trying to glean something from the internet and from all the antenna books and stuff like that and come up with a simple solution. Yeah, that's yeah, that's safe and meets code and and keeps everybody. And I and I have some meters I can measure down. I can measure down to micro ohms. So I'm gonna 
you know, take some measurements and then when I do it first and then, then I can check it too, like in a year or two, maybe make sure nothing's corroded and all that kind of stuff. You have a megger? I have a megger, but I also have a micro ohm meter. I can measure down to millionths of an ohm. Okay. So I can, I can check how, how thorough or how, um, how good the, the actual ground connection is. Okay. Now that's DC, mind you, or it's actually low frequency AC is what it is, but it's frequency. not, it's not RF. So the megas we used were 600 volt. But how does that check the, I mean, how does that confirm your ground is good for the mega? You want to check resistance of the ground, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, my, mine is like megas usually only go down to ohms, right? Yes. This is down to like 0. 0.000001 ohms. Yeah, not inter well, you know, well, we were, we didn't <laughs> need to go that low. I forget what it was. We had to go one meg or 10 meg. I can't remember now, you know, for your building ground rods, but I, you know, so long ago. I mean, I thought my drill ground rod professionally was when I was an apprentice. Yeah. So what's, the, what's the proper terminology? Is it called a DC ground? Or is it like, because I heard both you and Peter, uh, Kevin, both, both you and Peter say a low frequency ground. Is that the correct terminology? Or is it called a DC ground? No, I think it's just, it's just called a ground. That's, yeah. I mean, for, as far as electrical safety, they just, they just worry about it being grounded, right? And right. and, and the same point? ground. You can't have different grounds. That's that's the whole point, I think. I think I think the only term you might see if you look in the code, but it might say building ground, but that would yeah. be different. But they, they don't even care about RF. Oh. You know, no. if you have RF in the shack, it's probably because it's on the outside of your coax state. Yeah. Right? And your breakers might your breakers may be tripping because of the um you know, there are, are they arc flash breakers or sorry, are they arc fault breakers? Yeah, the, the, the electrician that uh, wired up the basement, he warned me and said uh, these breakers might pop because he, he said the new breakers now that they're putting into homes that he's required under code. He said if you connect a, a vacuum, an older vacuum, and you turn on the vacuum, it'll pop the breaker. Any, yeah, or anything with a variable frequency drive in it, like the new washing machines, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they can all trip them. So what, what, what's happening there? Why is that tripping it? They're trying to they're trying to prevent arcing faults in wiring. So wiring that, especially like going to bedrooms and stuff, that's like you know might have an extension cord under a rug or something like that, and the cord is damaged. So these breakers are trying to detect a certain frequency of current flow, like high relatively high frequency, like hundreds of kilohertz. And from that, they say, oh, that might be an arc fault. Let's trip. So, but, but you can get hundreds of kilohertz, you know, from things like ham radios. <laughs> and, so it be, and they're quite sensitive. Could it be my breaker tripping because of the RFI coming in? And yes. 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 And says, oh, there's a ground fault here. And yeah, no, not a ground fault. No. Arc fault. An arc it's different. Fault. That's not a ground fault. It's not it's, ground fault detectors aren't tripping. It's these. It's these newer. They're uh, called arc faults. Arc fault breakers. Dave, uh, the EAC here. Well, you know Dave in in Kingston here. He had a hell of a problem with this, but I think he cured it ninety percent of it by with, with uh, putting cores around the things. But you it's, can you it's can put there. cores. Yeah. yeah, my my daughter my daughter had a, the, the problem in her house with they were kept. They, every time they turn on the washing machine, it would it would trip, and because uh, they got a new washing machine in their new house. Anyway, so I I put it actually I put an RFI filter and all this kind of stuff, and let plug the washing machine in through that just to let them run for a bit, and it would it would work better. But I didn't obviously have the right frequency that was being suppressed, mm -hmm. so he ended up putting a different generation of Siemens breaker in the panel, and that cured it. So would I? Because they knew there was a problem. Would I need to put chokes on all my electrical outlet plugs on my shack going into the wall? Because that's how that arc fault or whatever yep. low frequency is going to go in. So yep. I, would choke, I would choke my antenna, my coax, obviously. But if I still have a problem. Yeah, then, then you could do that. Yeah. But I think that's but what choke. Dave had to do, Peter, was he had to choke all of his electrical connections. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly all what he did, but I just know he went through a fairly extent. I'll ask him. I'll ask him and I'll let you know. Uh, 
Klaus, you had another comment? Yeah, Dave, I, sorry. I think you should change the fuses from breakers. <laughs> hey, I got aluminum wiring. I got fuses. I'd rather have fuses than breakers. You know, it's a lot simpler. <laughs> fuses are a lot safer. Yeah. But you can't. Sure. I got into an argument with my insurance company in this old house we had over in the beaches. And uh, they said they weren't going to insure the house unless we went to a circuit breaker. And I said, well, you know what? <laughs> fuses are safer. I'll, I'll are trust a fuse to blow before a breaker trip. Yeah, fuses are safer. Oh, for sure. For sure. It, there's no mechanics, Dave. It's all physics. Yeah. You should go around and exercise your breakers every once a year. You mean especially, with aluminum, especially with aluminum wiring, you want to stay away from breakers. I so, remember aluminum wiring. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, okay. So I guess I guess that'll be a, a a chat some night once I get my stuff all done in the shack and yeah. grounding and bonding and yeah, that'll be interesting. Because like I said, I've never had a clear, a clean, well, a, an explanation I could understand. You have that, but, you, that but, book off of Ward Silver. Yeah, but it, Dave, it does sound like you have RFI in your coax. Oh, for yeah. sure. I so, know. That. So choke off your coax first, right? A hundred percent. And and just on your your comment about that e meter, e field, uh, the specs for this says it works to um, I can't remember how many megahertz, how many hundred megahertz the meter works for, and it's actually got a, a RF spectrum analyzer in it. So it's actually telling me the frequency it's seeing. Yeah, this will be for RF power only. The E field portion is probably just a few hundred hertz. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so it, it, when I take this to my antenna, it's actually showing me a field. And if I take it close to the antenna, it's showing me thousands of volts per meter close to my antenna, which is what I would expect. Interesting. So I think it's working. Well, wait till the next snowfall and then get out there and check it again, Dave. Yeah, yeah, I should lick it. <laughs> any other, uh, any other comments, uh, questions on anything? Eric, that's what I miss you for, man. You could come and lick my antenna. <laughs> yeah, Dave, I just looked up uh, dirty balance. That's what they call uh, winding with coax around a form. They're calling for about twenty feet. Twenty feet of what? Oh, the, the RGA, RGA, uh, yeah. Yeah, I you know what I've got. I'm I'm close to that. I think. You got. To I'm not using RG8. I'm using uh, LMR 400. Okay, well, look at it. I'm sure, pretty sure you can use the same thing. Yeah. But there, there's tons of stuff uh, on Google. Just Google uh, "dirty balan," they call it, and yeah. it'll give you some uh, 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 dimensions and links and all that stuff. Well, well, I ordered the. Um, those clamp on chokes from uh, Palomar, and they seem, from what I see on their site and the stuff they sell, they seem to understand how to choke off uh, RF. Now, it was just a suggestion while you're waiting for them to come in. Yeah, it's been a month. I just contacted them yesterday to say, What the WTF? Like, I ordered this a month ago and I haven't seen it. No, yeah. Things yeah. down. Ani ordered something from the states uh, beginning of December. It's still not here. Yeah. So. Wow. Okay. Any other comments on any subject? Any well, subject? Any subject? Yeah. Any subject. I think that's a good name for uh, our meetings. We have this AF mixer meeting. But I think the other meeting should be renamed Dirty Balance. <laughs> Was dirty there, old balance. Have a dirty balance on on uh, Thursday nights then. Yeah, dirty. even better. Dirty old balance. I like. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you see? Did did you uh, yeah. see the? Uh, um, they're talking about uh, uh, the four days of May. No, what were they saying? Well, I sent you the email. I haven't looked. I, I, you, you know. I just got home a little while ago. I haven't even looked in the worst case, they, they, they're they planning on holding it and running it. They got everything all lined up. But, of course, if Dayton cancels, they won't hold it. 
for sure. Uh, but the big problem is that if the conditions are still out there, the hotel's got a severe restriction on the, uh, I think they'll limit it to 100 people or something like that to a room and stuff. So it may, I think the odds are much better that four days of May this year will be a uh, an online event. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, everybody's getting used to them now, right? And there's been some really good conferences uh, done online. So why not? Yeah, let me, first, let me kick out Dave. Let me kick him out of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. your vaccine. Yeah, so I think, I think we're going to probably go online because I can't, you know, by the time they they get to it, that hotel is not going to likely lift their restrictions. Yeah, and I can't see things being that much different 120 days from now down there, right? No. 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 Yeah, let's just hope the White House isn't burning. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I, I don't think Dave here is going to go, no matter what they do. So, and I'm probably leaning more towards not attending this year. There's just the way things are going. Anyway. Anyway. Okay. Here we go, guys. Nice. All right. Good night, all. Well, okay. thank everybody for attending. Uh, good seeing everybody again. I guess we'll see you in another couple of weeks. If anybody wants to hang around afterwards, uh, fair enough. Uh, if not, we'll catch up with you, like you say, in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, Dave and Peter, hang on. Uh, after everybody's left. Okay. 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 Good night, all. See you guys. God, Dave's, Dave's face is getting bigger and bigger. Ah, ugly. Eric, how's it going, man? I haven't, I haven't spoken to you in like, what, three hours? Four yeah, hours? Please. Something like that. Hey, Dave, fix your mic. Dave, fix your mic. I feel it's the beginning of the of the uh, session, but then it's gotten all kind of noisy. How? What do you mean? There's like I don't know—is it background noise or distortion or?